So, so everyone, if you could please take your seats. And, and in a couple of minutes, the, um, the students will also be joining us. They've, um, they've pretty much wrapped up their presentations, and they'll be making them after you've concluded your, your comments. So if, when you look at the program, you'll see that we did the, um, the Cliff Notes version of, um, of BIOS. People have, people have um, many, many years of experience, and, and some of the bios were two or three pages long, befitting their level of experience. And we cut them to one paragraph, so please take a look at, at those bios. But you have, you have already heard from Lisa earlier this morning, and she is very experienced in many, many different areas, but clearly has been working in this area as well. And as just about one of the oldest people here, um, she, she has a special affinity for um, a topic very near and dear to me, which I made, made clear to all the, the high school students as well, okay. that they had to talk about the elderly and whatever they did, because I wanted to make sure they were looking out for me. And, um, and, and as we went through the charrette, actually, that, that actually did occur. So I don't know if we made it to the final cut from their presentations that, are, that we're going to hear in a little while, but I know it was in their thought process. I'm sure it did. But uh, I, I know that you're all looking forward to hearing from Lisa. I, I'm trying to stretch a little bit because I told them all to come in, and there's about 12 of them, so they'll wander in while you're talking. All right, well, come, come forward. Thank you very much. And, and once again, we'll say thank you again. You know, the breakfast, the lunch, the... We have to say thank you to her. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. How are you all doing? Great. It's so powerful to be with all of you today. But as a lifetime educator spanning teaching from you know, fifth grade to serving as a college president, even though the content was so fabulous, I was happy to have the stretch because I was worried about all of us as learners. Sometimes we need to, we can only take in so much um, in, one, in one seating. I am, uh, it's just a total privilege for me to be here, as I said, with my colleagues, Dan and Kara and Laura and Margie also. Give a wave, our colleagues from AARP Miami. I know the five of us who have um, varying degrees or levels of working relationships with so many of you in your organizations are already at midday. We just had, a, we got together, the five of us were really excited for future possibilities to collaborate and work with a number of you on building a resilient South Florida and also advancing the work that we do to fight for and equip um, people who are 50 and older to live their best lives and at AARP Foundation to be sure that low-income individuals have opportunity in their lives. So we'll look forward to more work together. I am just overwhelmed by the experience, uh, the expertise in this room, and what has become a learning community, a learning collaborative. Certainly today, but as you've worked together, many of you over many, many years, and just note that our sponsorship is reflective of AARP Foundation's commitment. We are in this with you and a very willing partner and, and want to continue to learn with you as we, as we increase our work here in South Florida as well. I thought Ana Maria did a great job of talking about the framework for Habitat 3, and I'm really uh, pleased and privileged to serve on the National Committee. But just to put it back into the space as we talk for a little bit together today, we remind ourselves that to meet the test of Habitat 3, we need to invest in people and communities for upward mobility, to secure housing op options and opportunities for all, and to respond to change and build resilience. And certainly, as I've had a chance to learn about the scope of the project work and collaboration, collective impact work for those who've already uh, presented, we really are, you are really meeting that test um, in South Florida. At AARP Foundation, we see housing as the linchpin for well-being, both for the linchpin both for individuals and communities, but also for the community itself. And if you really think about linchpin, we know that it's defined as being a person or a thing that holds something together and as the most important part of a complex situation or system. So it gets back to the systems change work that we're all committed to. Housing, in our mind, really fits that definition of linchpin. 
because with adequate and affordable housing in place, then we have this platform for other community action, but certainly for individuals and communities for the possibility of resilience. And even as so many of you were using the word resilience this morning and throughout the dialogue, I was just listening to it and hearing it and just the tonality of the word is optimistic as we think about resiliency and resiliency moving into a world and community where people in fact can thrive. That notion of resilience, as you heard me say briefly in the welcome, means everything to the work of AARP Foundation because it is about bouncing back from stresses or shocks. For low income and struggling and vulnerable older adults, it's about getting back up after you've been knocked down. It's why we do the work that we do on behalf of low-income people who are 50 and older across the nation. AARP Foundation is the charitable affiliate of AARP, and we work in a deliberate way using lean startup methodology to create and advance effective solutions so that low-income older adults are able to secure the essentials or to meet their most basic needs so that low-income people who helped build our nation have an opportunity to recapture the American dream that was discussed in a presentation a bit earlier this morning. So our work is focused on four interrelated and truly stubbornly persistent social problems. We work to ensure that low-income older adults have access to nutritious food, affordable and safe housing, critical, healthful social connections, and income generation opportunities across the lifespan. We spent some time this morning talking about workforce and housing for the workforce. And when one thinks about uh, low-income older adults, they, older adults want to be in the workforce for longer. Low-income, excuse me, older adults need to be in the workforce for longer. So those income generation opportunities are critically important to the resilience of low-income older adults. And when we reach out to help older adults who are in need, we see that as planting a seed in the fertile ground that already exists in themselves and their own resilience. So the challenge is, how do we come together to grow that possibility? So many of us, I think, um, in life become confined by our own experiences and maybe a little bit too invested in the way that we do things in the now, in the present or today. And what's been really inspiring about today's conversation is that you all are thinkers and doers, um, actors who really are about honoring what's working within organizations, systems, and communities, but really very willing to recognize that we need to think and act in different ways going forward. I have some suggestions, just suggestions to add to today's dialogue. Um, given the work that you've done, really five suggestions, I think. You've had many, many long lists, so I'm going to pair, pair it back to five um, opportunities to talk about. First of all, and we heard this so powerfully from everyone in the last panel, we need to give voice to the voiceless, to listen to and advocate for those who are so often not heard in our communities because we know that communities are really healthful, are healthiest when they are intentionally inclusive, intentionally inclusive of all of their members. But of course, you know, they can't, we can't do this when some members of the community are really or virtually invisible and when no one really listens to them. It's that difference, I think, between hearing and actually listening to individuals in our community. I was really fortunate two years ago to be able to go with a group of colleagues from AARP to Haiti as part of our efforts, we had funded some work where um, low-income older adults in Haiti were becoming uh, sources of strength for other older adults who were struggling across Haiti. And when I was there, I saw two graffiti slogans, which were on the wall of a meeting space for the older adults. And one said, and I quote, we're invisible. And the other on the wall said, we have a voice. And to me, those words really represented a yearning, a yearning on behalf of older, vulnerable adults to be heard and also to be seen. But people, and we know this, people living in poverty, whether it's in Haiti or the United States or in communities and nations around the globe, they deserve to be seen and they deserve to be heard. And that was so present in the conversations about what's happening at Liberty Square and what's happening at Tampa as we think about redevelopment work, so I'm inspired by those, those new developments there. Millions 
of those struggling with poverty in our nation are not seen and are not heard. And Anita and others spoke eloquently about that topic as they were sharing remarks with us. Right here in South Florida, poverty is rampant among older adults. In Florida as a state, overall one in 10 people who are 65 and older live below the poverty line. But in Miami-Dade, it's double that figure. One out of every five seniors is struggling to obtain or to meet their most basic needs. All of us in this room are well aware of the crisis in Flint, Michigan. But if anyone in our nation thinks that what happened in Flint, right, is just about Flint, or just about drinking water, we know that they need to think harder. Flint is a function of powerlessness and of voicelessness. So often, those of us coming in to help feel that we know, that we know what is best for a community. Sometimes we may be developing solutions before we, come on in, <laughs> developing solutions before we've taken the time to really understand the problem, the root causes of the problem as well. The reality is those in need know what they need, and they know what they need much better than we do. We just need to listen to actively and, and really, truly listen, to listen to people with different viewpoints, different cultural perspectives, to give them an equal seat at the table. I'm always recommended let's make it a round table if we can, where there is no clear head of that table when we're gathering together. In my mind, if we commit to, let's just jettison the notion that our own personal lens or our own cultural background is the only perspective. And once we do that, I think we, be, we become really open to new insights and to new dialogues. Only then, from my point of view, can we become effective advocates for and partners with all members of our community. Second, and this has been discussed powerfully today. Second, we cannot do it alone. Collaboration, as we know, is critically essential to community development work and building resilience. It fuels the collective impact that can make a real difference in people's lives and in the life of a community. The concept of collective impact is essentially a simple, but it's powerful and also important. It starts with a premise that complex social problems cannot be solved by any one organization working in isolation. And I'm seeing, seeing a lot of nods from you. Collective impact requires putting institutional ego aside. It enables us to tackle these persistent, complex problems together. It gets us out of our silos and into truly shared spaces where we can bring together a wide range of actors, each with a different lens, a different background, a different expertise, but each sharing and committing to a commonly defined goal or a shared goal. With collective impact, we proceed from the understanding that no single policy, single program or group can solve a complex social problem by itself. We focus on the social determinants of health in a community. We focus on data and evidence, root causes, and we share the goals, but as importantly, we share the accountability to get the work done. It's precisely what we enjoy doing with all of you, and, and, and it's working here. We've been here in South Florida for the past couple of years, AARP Foundation, working with many of you on home rebuilding projects, financial resiliency and education workshops, job seeker seminars for people who are 50 and older, packing meals to address food insecurity and also developing some systems change work around food and nutrition, and outreach efforts that bring isolated people back into the connected framework of their families and of their communities. We identify other organizations, local organizations and people, who are doing the work and have the expertise and then it's our job at AARP Foundation to become your partners to leverage what you're already doing that's working and to be sure that you have the fuel to have the social and measurable impact that we know we need to have together. You know, it's not a weakness for us as people or as organizations to say that we can't do all the work, 
that we cannot do the work alone. It's actually a strength to recognize the advantages of collaboration, moving toward collective impact, and that, of course, is what Habitat 3 is all about. Third, I challenge each of us to actively cultivate agents of opportunity. When we take on these tough, these stubbornly persistent social problems, we don't always need to build a whole new infrastructure. Often what we need to do is find new partners, work with existing partners in new ways, sort of reorganize the collective assets in a neighborhood or in a community. We need to cultivate the agents of opportunity who are living and working among us. And so what do I mean when I talk about agents of opportunity? To me, these are individuals and also organizations or professions even that are already primed to help, to be the helpers, to do the work, to be of service, to channel their energy for good, to channel that energy for good in new and perhaps unexpected directions. So. Let me be clear, when I talk about cultivating agents of opportunities, this is not just about nonprofits working with other not-for-profits, though that could be an outcome. I'm talking about organizations across the spectrum, really cross-sector opportunities for nonprofits and for-profits, public sector, private sector, educational institutions, and whole professions. I want to tell you about some work we've invested in um, in Philadelphia. We're working with a chain of supermarkets in Philadelphia, and we talked about food access, or it was talked about in an earlier presentation. And this uh, owner of a group of grocery stores saw the need in low-income communities and saw a need beyond uh, building grocery stores in food deserts toward providing good food at affordable prices, but with a fresh perspective of also providing access to financing, benefits programs, nutritionists and dietitians right in the store. They saw the opportunity to address a food desert by creating whole person solutions in new grocery stores in low income neighborhoods. So they actually located dietitians and nutritionists and a credit union and placed them right inside the supermarket for one on one services and support for their customers. They took a new look at this old problem of access to services and access to nutritious, affordable food and access to more information about good nutrition because hunger is a public health issue. And at its root is the need to address nutrition. I mean, it's a shame in a nation with such abundance that for the population we serve at AARP Foundation, 10 million plus older adults are food insecure and that number is growing. So these new solutions become really important. So the supermarkets are turning what we formerly know as food deserts, which are still in abundance across this nation, and turning those food deserts into wellsprings of nutrition. And they're also building stronger communities by acting as critical connectors to program services and opportunities for the low-income consumers who are shopping in the grocery store. So for me, this is just a prime example of an agent of opportunity. You are all agents of opportunity. Agents of opportunity are all around us. We just have to commit each and every day to opening our eyes and looking for them. Colleges and universities, of course, very near and dear to my life and career as an educator, are always ready agents of opportunity. We know that in a huge thank to the, thanks to the University of Miami and the School of Architecture. Colleges and universities support a culture, this important culture of lifelong learning and of access, and they enhance the employment prospects of people at any age, not just the young. Miami-Dade College, and I hope we have colleagues from Miami-Dade College with us today, yay! <laughs> Hello. <laughs> As play, you're playing a key role with AARP Foundation in a program that we call Back to Work 50 Plus, and it helps unemployed or underemployed people who are 50 to 64 years old. The program provides critical one-on-one -on -one coaching and advice and very practical tips for getting back into the job market 
the, the market of Miami-Dade College students into hot jobs, or in other words, jobs that actually exist in a community, and preparing adults 50 to 64 to be able to get back into the workforce in those jobs. Participants tell us that in working at Miami-Dade College in the Back to Work 50 Plus program, they have gained confidence your confidence erodes when you become long-term unemployed. They have gained new skills that are needed in the work world of today and of the future. They have gained real opportunities to find jobs, to improve their financial capability, therefore their financial security for them and their families, and importantly, to avoid poverty as they age. And also, when you think about agents of opportunities, what about nurses, the nursing profession overall. I hope we have some nurses here. We know this uh, ourselves. We've read about it a lot. But the nurses are ready, willing, and able to do much more to meet the health care needs of our communities. And volunteers. The work at AARP Foundation and at AARP is fueled by volunteerism. And thank you to many of you who have shared with me that you have been with me on the packing floor at Southeast Nova when we've been packing one million meals, that you've been working with Margie and Laura and our colleagues in Florida and the foundation on many, many volunteer opportunities. Volunteers often come to our organizations for a particular purpose that they've defined in their life. And as I said, it might be to renovate a home or to help with a financial capability workshop or to spend an hour packing meals for food insecure adults. And that's terrific. But I think that we have a real opportunity to harness the growing desire to volunteer across this nation and the willingness of volunteers to help others. This is a benefit of an aging America. Older adults are a boom to our communities. They have passion, purpose, wisdom, and they want to contribute in meaningful ways. So we need to harness the power of volunteerism to meet the critical needs in our community. I'll give you another example that also involves uh, volunteers at the college level, intergenerational volunteerism. Last year, AARP Foundation paired ROTC students at Florida Memorial University with older veterans in a semester-long buddy system. Over the course of several meetings, the Florida Memorial students taught the older adults about technology and social media and trained the veterans to share their stories about their military experiences using these platforms. It was part of our isolation work to be sure that the low-income veterans, vulnerable veterans, were able to connect with community again. The result, you can imagine, the young people gained as much as the help they were providing to the older veterans. It was connections across the generations. And that's also powerful fuel. So I know that we could, you can all think of many other agents of opportunities, and we're going to hear from the high school students a little bit later. It could be clubs looking for a service opportunity, reading tutors who are helping to fight poverty by ensuring that children are readers by the end of third graduate from high school and move on to other opportunities. Sports teams, religious groups, civic organizations, businesses, there are so many possibilities. Fourth, let's come together and work toward a cure. In my mind, poverty is a national ill, and we need to come together to work toward a cure. You know, if we were, thank you, Jose. <laughs> thank you. I think about it in the following terms. If we came together today in a design charrette to build a health care system, we would not just decide to build the emergency room, would we? Many of the problems that low-income seniors face, of course, require urgent relief. They are threatened, for example, with foreclosure now. They don't have enough resources to pay their utilities now. They are hungry now. That, of course, is that emergency room part. But we should be there for them, of course, in the immediacy of their need. But we also have to keep our eye on a bigger prize, working toward a cure. Resilience cannot really flourish unless long-term solutions are put in place. Our work on housing is a case in point. 
One way we're meeting that emergency room or immediate need right here in South Florida and for people around the nation is through our Housing Solution Center at AARP Foundation. We offer free HUD certified counseling to homeowners 50 and older who are at risk of foreclosure. And you can imagine that people call us in real desperation with a pressing need for help and advice right then in the moment. And our HUD certified counselors give them the help that they need. But we have to come together to find these longer term solutions, the rest of the healthcare system, if this was a healthcare design charrette, so that we can improve homes and communities, provide health services, so that older adults don't have to leave their homes or leave their communities as their health care needs change and as they age. Right now, and you, many of you know this uh, acutely, and we heard about it this morning, right now less than 2% of existing housing stock, less than 2% of existing housing stock is adequate, adequately equipped to meet the needs of seniors with features such as no-step entries, grab bars, and other elements of what is known as universal design. And for the developers who are here today or who are working so in a, such a focused, determined, mission-focused way to solve this need, it is upsetting to know that so many of the barriers are barriers of getting the adequate financing in order to provide these, provide these features. Universal design in the home is an advantage not just for older people, but for all of us across the lifespan. It's important for communities as well, and I know that the group on Age Friendly Miami is working on this. Streets and sidewalks, uh, for one simple example, are, uh, for seniors are safer for everyone. I really want us to think about this. If you have wide sidewalks, if you have longer light time to walk across the street, if you have curb cuts that can accommodate a wheelchair, those could also accommodate a stroller or a skateboard. So it really is about uh, age friendly across the lifespan. We're really pleased at AARP Foundation to be working very closely with HUD to look for new ways to identify and address the needs of housing and, and health care in communities as we go forward. There's no denying the challenges of this approach aimed at both providing urgent relief and also achieving a cure. We must not be tempted to continue chasing the need without investing in more strategic solutions. In fact, we have to do both, and we know that. We have to be there for the now, for the present, while keeping our vision focused on a transformed future. And finally, social connections matter. Community doesn't mean just the infrastructure of homes, hospitals, roads, transportation, services. It means the social environment as well as the built environment of a community. A town or a city is really only well built if its people can interact, if they can commune. Social isolation is one of those problems that is too often invisible across our nation. People suffer disconnection from their family, from their friends, from their community, behind shuttered windows, and behind closed doors. One in five older adults is at serious risk for social isolation. Studies show that feeling lonely and disconnected leads to a host of health problems. In fact, one study found, and I find this unbelievable, one but it is true, one study found that prolonged social isolation among older adults is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. The mortality rate is three times higher, three times higher the mortality rate for older adults who are socially disconnected. Social connectedness is a basic human need. It can be a gateway to basic services and to a more fulfilling life. It can be the catalyst for resilience. Staying connected touches people's lives in a profound way. It brings us together across generational lines. It provides a vital link to those who have been forgotten. And it can make it more likely that the voices of those who are so often ignored are actually heard. Social connections are the lifeblood of our communities. So, you know, those are the five ideas that I would add to this growing, long, and inspiring list that we've been discussing today, that as we think about solving for poverty in our communities, for poverty for older adults and across the lifespan, and improving our communities to build the most resilient South Florida,
that we focus on collaboration and collective impact, identifying and cultivating, cultivating agents of opportunities, working toward a cure for poverty, and building vital, essential social connections as we think about redevelopment and, and rebuilding in our communities. These guiding principles are the foundation of a strong, resilient community. Resilient communities, as we've discussed, bring diverse people and groups together. Resilient communities listen and advocate for each other. They recognize and reinforce the commonality of interest within neighborhoods, between neighborhoods, and across the lifespan. Habitat 3 challenges us to move beyond old limits and tired arguments and conversations. It calls us to reach for higher ground through a spirit of resilience and creative collaboration. In its essence, it's about imagining a better distant future. It is about sharing our best practices, which starts with cultivating and identifying our best practices. It's about a true commitment to innovation and collaboration today to create, test, and scale long-term solutions for everyone. It's about applying rigor to the fulfillment of our dreams because rigor and resilience together will help us achieve that brighter, better future here in South Florida and across our nation. Again, it's a delight to support your work and to be with you today. Thank you. I got us on track. <laughs>